Hello everyone, I didn't expect you to see that many people here actually today. Um, now, when I started to um, prepare this presentation, I, I started to think, oh, I, but I don't know who the people are who actually will come here to listen to me. Uh, and uh, usually this talk is like purely Java based and uh, I don't really know how many of you actually doing Java or related to Java or know anything about Java. So could you show me the hands so I, I know then how much should I skip? Okay, more than half, so that's, that's good enough actually. So I, I work for Zero Turnaround. I work for, uh, with two products, uh, uh, Gerable and Xrable. Uh, those are the tools for developers. I, I'm sure you, you pretty much all of you know about these tools and about the company, but who doesn't know? Show up the hand. No? No one? So One. one? Yeah. How come? <laughs> OK. Anyways, one is a good percentage. Um, so yeah, those are the two, two tools. Uh, for the last year, I've been working with both of them. Uh, and with Gerable, I've been working for, for the last four years. Um, and, and now I'm switching mainly to extra, but I will show both of the tools, but actually most of the talk is not about the tools, but about the technology, uh, the, the um, technology in Java that makes, enables us to develop those tools. Um, so the first part is boring, right? Technical and boring. And then we skip to, uh, to fun part and see the, the tools in action. Um, so my agenda for tonight is that I will talk about some, uh, I will give you the overview of Java agents and the instrumentation API in Java. And uh, I will show you uh, some code and write some code for you like to have some fun uh, with the Java Assist library that makes it like possible to patch stuff uh, on the fly uh, in Java. And uh, then we'll see how is it applied in uh, Xrebel and Jrebel. And we, you know, we could have some discussion as well. So I, I already said that those are the tools for Java. And like, if we are talking about tooling in Java, there are like a lot of segments of tools. There are IDs, of course, which the, th the very first thing you, you think about in Java are the IDs, right? Then profilers, code coverage tools, like debuggers. Debuggers, it like, it not necessarily that those debuggers that are in IDE. You might have debuggers that are specialized for some uh, specific task. So then those tools like a separate um, segment, actually. Then monitoring ag uh, agents. Uh, how many of you have used, for instance, New Relic or AppDynamics? OK. Or you, at least you know what it is, right? So you have an agent running in your application, actually sending the data somewhere, right? But 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 it's really an agent. It has to hook into your application to actually collect the data, right? And then there is like a segment of Gerable-like tools, which is kind of funny. But if you Google for that, if you Google for you know Gerable or reloading or whatever, then there are people asking for um, what kind of tool I could used to do Gerable like reloading. So there wasn't a tool before that to do what Gerable does. And uh, it basically created its own segment of tools. And there are some more. Maybe you can, someone can tell me what else you can think of in terms of Java tooling. Uh, but maybe there are some specific ones. Um, so Java agents, like since Java 1.5, we have an option in JVM when you start the application, uh, you can pass in the argument minus Java agent and give it a jar, which implements uh, Java agent contract. Uh, th this is just a convention, but this convention gives you a hook inside the JVM, uh, inside the class loading process, where you could do magic stuff. So-called magic, because if we I think uh, from a Ruby developer's point of view or Python developer's point of view, they're doing it like everywhere. And for them, it's not magic at all. But in Java, since it's compiled language, we have to do some not really usual things to, uh, do, to do this stuff, to implement agents. So agents, they are like, you can, you can group the uh, facts about it in, in this way. Um, agent class has to implement some methods, and then it has like 
the hooks into JVM, and the hooks provide you the uh, interfaces so you can you know, use the APIs when you have the hook into the JVM. Then you have, have to package it properly, which is the nastiest thing in, in Java agents, because you cannot just run the code from the disk. You, you have to package it specifically to make it an agent. And then you, know, you, you have to specify this JVM argument. So this is like required one. Um, so agent itself, if you, if you start like the implementing the entry point, uh, this is just a class, whatever you name it. Um, it has to implement two methods basically. Actually one, but since Java 1.6 you have another method added into this contract. But uh, the, the primary method is this pre-main method that takes argument string and instrumentation uh, interface. And you don't pass it in, you just implement this method, right? So you, you kind of have this instrumentation there and uh, rely on JVM. And whatever, what you actually do to, um, to add your behavior to the agent is that you add transformers. And transformers are used to transform classes. So your application starts up, you add transformers, and uh, the, the logic inside the transformers are, is responsible for whatever you do with the classes. Add your new you know, logging statements inside methods or whatever. And then you have to package it, right? So, but this is specifically for uh, JAL 1.5, which is very old one, but it's the, the main functionality of the agent. Uh, since Java one point six, you have this agent main method, which allows you to attach to the running JVM. So if you have already Java process running, you may start an agent from another process, attach to the running JVM remotely, and do transformations again. So you don't really have to you know, run with the agent initially to do the transformations. You can do it post factum. And again, you have to have this proper manifest. You have to package it properly. Uh, and yeah, this is what it does. So manifest, manifest is used to uh, specify some behavior for the agent, whether it's allowed to do some things. Like uh, you, you can, you can uh, have a package where you have like pre-main agent and you have agent main agent which are different classes, different implementations. So if you start with the agent, it does one thing, and if you, you attach, it should do something else, right? And then you can have like all kind of um, permissions, whether it can redefine the classes or it shouldn't redefine the classes. But I, honestly, I didn't ever think, like I didn't find any reason why those attributes are actually required if you're already implementing the agent and its main pur purpose is actually to retransform classes, why sh you should give the permissions there. Um, not, not really, um, I don't know, I don't have the reason for that. I don't see the reason. So this is like a, um, an example of real manifest from Jarable. So we say that, okay, we add some classes from our own jar into the class path. So our class, our own classes should be available to the agent. Then we have the main class. If we just run the jar, there should be like this class. And if we um, want to use the agent contract, then we have like something, something else here, right? So we have another class implementing the agent. And it can redefine the classes there. So we say true. So if we think of, like this is the example of uh, attaching agents. There is an API in Java that you can use. It's, in, it's located in tools.jar inside the Java runtime distribution. It's the virtual machine and uh, just, you know, you, you specify that the, the process ID there, 2177, is, that's the process ID, uh, although it's string. And you attach it to JVM and you say that, okay, I want to load my new agent, which belongs to this remote process. And whenever the agent is loaded, it fires up the transformations. So you will retransform the classes in, in the remote running machine. 
And of course, you can detach after that, afterwards. So this is just, you know, yeah, this is just the visualization of, of the same thing. Um, and two main interfaces that we have seen in this sample agent class is the instrumentation which is provided by the JVM and the class file transformer which is implemented by you if you are implementing uh, the agent. And there are a bunch of methods inside the instrumentation. So you add your own transformers to the instrumentation interface. Uh, and, and those transformers are executed by the JVM so you don't have control over that. But what you have control over is that you can, if you have a ref reference to that interface somewhere in your application, you may have like uh, an interface to, the, to your agent inside your application. Then you actually have those interesting methods here, uh, redefine classes, retransform classes, so that in runtime, you may call to those methods and actually redefine, like create new definitions of the classes. So imagine I have one class loaded into JVM, I have changed its source code, I have recompiled, and then I can call one of those methods to, you know, to really define the new behavior inside the JVM. This is like a, a, a hook which is used in JRebel, but uh, it doesn't provide you the whole functionality. It cannot redefine everything. It can just redefine single statements in the running uh, application. Uh, when, when we implement our own transformers, there is like a method which uh, has plenty of parameters, but the only one which is actually interesting for us is this byte buffer, which actually represents real class which is being loaded into the JVM at the startup. Uh, so if we have that, we may uh, do whatever we want with that. Right? We may remove some methods, totally rewrite the methods of the class that, that is being loaded, and change the behavior of the application. And for that we have um, libraries for convenience, so we don't really have to work with bytes and bits, but we have Java Syst, we have ASM, we have CGLib, uh, all kinds of libraries that allow manipulation of our classes. So if we try to recap what, what the process actually is implementing, uh, when you start up the <coughs> JVM and your classes, your application classes are, are being loaded, then the class loading is a, is a process. Imagine the, the classes are being loaded here, right? And, and the instrumentation is kind of a separate thing that sits next to the next to the process and it adds the transformers to this process or actually you are adding it instrumentation is actually executing those transformers on on the classes when they are loaded and of course you can delegate to those libraries for you know for convenience to really transform the classes and of course once once the, the classes are transformed you can you know push it back to the jvm and you have all this new behavior there. Yeah? yeah. Go ahead. So question. <sighs> That's a very good question, and there is very thin difference, which I cannot explain to you. <laughs> I mean, like, really, if you, if you try to read this Java doc there, it's like three pages long, and there's just corner cases that, you know, depends when you are doing it, depends what you are doing with it. And it has different parameters as well. Uh, yeah, maybe if I, if I can remember, I will tell you. So for us, those transformers are actually plugins inside JRebel. We just specify a plugin as a set of transformers. Uh, and every plugin is basically an integration with some kind of server or a framework where we know what we want to patch. Why we want to patch, you probably know, but uh, I will show you later. So Java Syst. This is the library that we are using, and I would like to, to show you some code, like some simple one. And for that, we switch to the IDE. Yay. And I have some examples. Right. So let's start with something really simple. We have a class here, 
which just prints out a full statement. Bigger? Like this? Good? Good? So, yeah, we have a statement, or a class, which just has a single statement, nothing else. And uh, imagine we want to add some behavior to this class uh, in a way that maybe you want to print something before this uh, system out print a lamb and after. Just very simple example here. Um, so what we could do is to first we get a representation of the class path of the, of the application so that we get all the, the pool of the classes. And then we could ask from the class pool that, hey, please me, give me this, uh, this class. So I give the fully qualified name, right? So, and once I have this re uh, representation of this class inside Java Assist, I can do whatever I want with it. So, for instance, in, in, here, in, in this example, I have, oops, sorry. Just make it smaller. So I, I find the method which I want to, uh, to patch, which I want to change. And then I add one statement before that, like in the very beginning of the method. And insert after, inserts a statement in the very end of the method. So if I execute this one, I will see dash, dash, dash foo dash dash dash, right? And in A, I have only foo. So this is the very uh, simple example, but you can imagine what you can do with it. Yeah, question? If the method throws. Uh, this method, if this method throws an exception. Throw an exception. Well, yeah, it would print then, you know, dash dash dash, foo, for instance, then throw an exception, and uh, the second dash 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 wouldn't be printed. So as, as if those statements were inside this code initially, because those statements were added when the class was actually loaded. Yes? Can you go with the debugger on a deeper stack levels? For example, if it calls another method from another class, can you like, uh, go there, hit next line, and next line? You mean, you mean if, the, um, if this method was added? Yeah. The added method. Yeah. Uh, if you generate uh, proper bytecode there, yes. But most likely, inside your application, you will not have any source code. You will just hit some random line which doesn't have a source code. So debugger will stop, but it will not show you anything. So debugging this kind of stuff is pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so this is this was the, the like very very simple. Um, Example, but imagine if we do a little bit more here, like printing uh, a variable, like a parameter. So if we do it here, we, we now have to uh, actually locate the method by the signature. And the signature was changed. So I actually have to know the type of the parameter and specify it when I, when I actually uh, looking up for this method. And types are specified a little bit differently than uh, just class names. So I actually have to write a descriptor. And this is, Java, is a Java type descriptor in Java. Like big L, Java lang string with slashes and then a semicolon. If I would have more uh, parameters inside the method, I would have to you now specify more like Java, lang, object, whatever, right? So now I actually specified the signature of a method that has uh, input parameter as string and void as return parameter. And imagine I would just like to I actually change it so, sorry? Why do you need the return parameter? Uh, always. Because you can't override the method with the same name and same input parameter, but different uh, return. 
that's a covariant return. You can do it in Java since Java 1.5. Let's remove this statement, actually, so we have an empty method. And we add this uh, print statement right here. So I would specify uh, the, the name of the variable, but you, you, uh, you have the names of uh, local variables only if you compile with debug info. And you might not have it at all. Or the, the third party libraries might not be compiled with debug info. So what you actually have to do is to know the order of the variable inside a method. Even if it's just a, not, not only the parameter, but also like a local variable there. So, and since we have uh, one parameter, and it's a virtual method, it's an instance method, the, the very first slot in the local variables table is occupied by this. Uh, of like of this class, so basically this class instance. So we have to specify number one here to actually point to that x parameter inside this statement here. So if I run, ah, okay, of course it doesn't compile. I have to actually specify something here. Hello, uh, run. Hello. So if we do it like this, one, two, three, four, run. So with this, you can imagine that, uh, for instance, your library that you, are tr you want to trace, you want to trace some library that is working inside your application, and, and you know what kind of methods you want to debug, you, you might write an agent that makes use of JavaSyst that does this kind of code rewriting and adding the logging statements inside every method that you're interested in, right? And you could record the parameters, you could record the local variables, you could record the state of the class, and so on. And this is what, you, what we are actually using inside Xrable, because we are tracing a lot of uh, what is happening inside JDBC driver, for instance, or, or uh, web service call, or anything like that. So that was the first example. Any questions? No? What happens if you throw an exception inside the function that doesn't uh, specify the exception? That's a good question. Let's try it. So. My, my foo method doesn't specify the exception, right? I'm pretty sure it ju will just throw an exception, so. Um, and do it like this. Throw new runtime IO exception. So what kind of result do you, do you expect, actually? That's reasonable, because it shouldn't. No such class. Oh, of course, Java I.O. Maybe this also will not compile. No, it will. It actually does throw an exception. Well, in runtime, but it did compile. So what you write here is not actually Java. And uh, oh, it's, it's Java-like syntax, right? And it, it supports a subset of Java. Sometimes if you try to write too much, like try, catch, cycle inside it, and maybe try, catch again, or if statement, like, you know, you have, like, nesting, then Java just cannot compile it uh, correctly. But it compiles and fails in runtime and just produces like uh, incorrect bytecode. So you, you have to be careful. You have to you know, split those statements that you are actually injecting. Um, like saying you have to, like don't take it seriously. I, I, I don't think you have to use this library at all. All right, the second. Uh, 
that like we have unmodified code that would like to attach to um, Audient. Um, oh, well, first of all, if Java effectively create instances of the patched object. Uh, well, if uh, if you have. It depends how you start your application, right? You, so you have two modes when you start with the agent or you have already running application and then you attach with the agent. So if you just start with the agent, you can do whatever you want. Like you have this hook using uh, the instrumentation API and in here the class pool. So you use this inside the transformer which was added inside the agent. So this is the entry point. Right? If you have a touching agent, then it's a bit more complicated because you have to iterate over the classes and redefine those because you have already running instances. But if you, if you did this once on the, uh, on the load time, then you don't have any, any problems with the existing instances because there is none. All right. So in, in this simple example, of course, I, I, I have a method that creates this patched class, but it actually loads it right here. If I loaded this class before, then I most likely would, would not be able to add new methods, but I still would, uh, would be able to add statements inside methods. But then I would have to call a special hot swap function inside the JVM to actually apply it. Right. Any more questions about this example? No? If you have uh, as a parameter your own class, you would also write this com dot your company dot your class. Uh, yes. Again, it depends. If I have to, if it, if I want to use some class that that is in the package of my my code somewhere and doesn't match this package, right? Then I actually have to import it and say that, okay, cp import, import packages, package, and then specify it here somewhere, right? And then you can refer to this imported packages just as, as, as classes, yes, exactly. So the second example is, uh, it's already pre-written again. I will not modify anything here, and uh, it's just um, it, JavaSyst provides you uh, means for creating proxies. In Java, you may have proxies as well, but the difference is that in Java you can create proxies only for interfaces. In JavaSyst, you can create proxies for object instances, even for classes or object instances. So, uh, if you used Hibernate. Right? It creates actually object instances, like proxies for, for classes, not for interfaces, not in a conventional Java way. So if we um, take a look here, so we have a proxy factory which will generate proxies for me. And I say, okay, please generate the proxy using this command. So what will actually be done is that this proxy factory will create a, a class in runtime which will extend this base class. So it's not really a proxy, it's a you know, child, child class, right? So this will be the proxy. It will be the subclass of the base class, and then you may do whatever you want uh, at your method handler. So whenever you um, invoke a method on that proxy, on that proxy instance, then you may override the behavior, you know, trace something and so on. So, uh, and, and in this example, I just wanted to show you that, oh, sorry, uh, wrong example. Um, I just wanted to show you that what's, what is generated for this proxy. So the proxy was the object, right? And its superclass is being, but I don't know if you can see it here. This is the proxy. It has a handler and its type is com.zt.bean, which was the real name of the superclass. But then it has like a, a suffix like 
JV, ST, whatever, like some numbers. So it's the generated class. And uh, sometimes it's useful because you have, you have to sometimes create proxies for uh, frameworks and you may not rely on the fact that framework creators will write interfaces. Uh, framework creators don't really write very nice code every time, right? They might use classes and you, if, if they don't use interface, then you cannot use just normal proxy inside Java. Again, so and the third example is a little bit bigger one. In, in here, I would like you uh, to show you how we like explain you how we actually integrate with um, with frameworks inside JRebel. So imagine we have a core class which is JRebel, right? So whatever it does, it reloads classes. Then uh, I, I said that uh, every framework requires dedicated integration, and every plugin for the framework is basically a transformer for that framework, which transforms some classes inside the framework. So how do we hook into those uh, frameworks? Uh, inside the core, we have all the plugins registered inside the list. So imagine this um, list of listeners, let me make it bigger, uh, contains all the integration points with the framework that we are currently working with. And, on, and the framework itself is this one. So we have very sophisticated framework here, which has a configure method and returns some object. Very advanced one, and it tells me that, okay, I'm being configured. Um, now, what should we do to integrate with that framework and being able to reinitialize the internals whenever we, we, we want? Uh, let's write some code. So first of all, we have to create uh, the class pool, right? So we have the representation of the class path, so we could have access to all the classes of the framework and, and, and our classes and so on. And then since the, the, the framework doesn't know about our classes, we have to import the package. So our package is right here, comes it or whatever. Then we, we have to ask, um, we have to work with that framework class. So we, we get the instance of that framework from memory. Um, CGI. And then we say, okay, this, this framework class, which is totally third party to us, should be registered inside our core, right here, right? We want to add it into our list here, but it has to implement listener, because we, we, ha we, we need to have a type there. Otherwise, we cannot work with it. So we say that, okay, dude, you have to implement listener. And since you implement listener, and listener is this interface here, it has to implement one single method on event, and we add this new method to the instance of that framework class, right? So we had added totally new interface, added totally new behavior. Now we can actually invoke that behavior whenever needed. And um, there, there should be um, like uh, a point, an integration point, when we actually add this new instance uh, of the framework to our list. And it could be done like in different ways. Like if, if this instance is created only once, we may uh, add the new code into the constructor. So inside uh, the framework, there is like a default constructor, right? So we just, uh, in runtime, we may have an access to that one and patch this constructor. And whenever the instance is created, we will just put and the, the, the new instance to our list. So this is what it does. It finds all the constructors from the class, like get constructors, 
And inside each constructor, if you have more than one, you add like the, the statement here. So we get the instance of shareable and add the listener. So ourselves, basically. And I have added login, login statement right here just to say that, OK, we are now calling the constructor. So let's check. Let's do a checkpoint here. We have one logging statement that says that the instance of the framework was created. And uh, another logging statement which will, sorry, yeah, which will be invoked whenever the framework is configured. Let's try that. And uh, sorry, it's the third example here. So we have to create the framework first. And we will see that this statement will be logged. Let's try that. Hey, we are calling the constructor, but we are not invoking the method. right? We haven't seen the statement that it was configured. And why? Because in, in the original instance, the method is not invoked. But we uh, have the ability to actually invoke it there. So if we, uh, at any point of time, let's say a class was reloaded by a gerable core, and then the core decides to uh, notify all the listeners that, hey, one class was reloaded. You might want to reconfigure your, yourself. right? So we, we call notify listeners. And the notify listeners will just call the on event. And as we have seen in our implementation here, in, in the own event uh, in implementation, we are calling the configure method, which belongs to framework. right? So if we call this one again, we will see both statements printed. right? So th this way, we actually hook into the frameworks. So from in inside. Uh, the framework classes, we implement our own interfaces, add those interfaces to the list internally, and then notify the listeners uh, if something has happened. And if it's something interesting, then you know framework could call its own reinitialization process. Uh, any questions? Otherwise, I have finished with my nice demo. No? No? OK. Right. So the two tools, they are agents. I just told you that there is like the Java agent property. And both Gerable and Xrable are agents you know, by, by contract. They add their own transformers, like depending on what kind of functionality we, we implement inside of those. Like for Gerable, we obviously create reloading process. In X Xrable, we add uh, logging and, and uh, tracing statements, and we record uh, invocations. Um, and I would like to show you the, the combination of those tools. So you actually can run multiple agents on, on the same process. Uh, you are not guaranteed that two agents, if you use them, will work like seamlessly because very often they will instrument the very same points inside your application and it will just conflict and it will just crash. But uh, since the, we have control over both of them, we, we made them uh, compatible. But actually, what happens if you have two agents doing the same stuff? So first one wins? Well, the, the, the most likely what you will see, you, you, you run two agents which might be monitoring the same stuff. And uh, you start up your application, you open the browser, and you see error 500, and nothing else, and some exceptions. So most likely, it will just crash and not work. So let's see. We don't need this anymore. But we have a running application. Yay, the very perfect one. Cats and dogs, right? Um, so it's based on Spring. We have two agents running. We have Xrebel widget here. 
and gerbil in the background. And uh, let's see what we can see here and change and see again. For instance, owners, yeah, too many queries executed, 24 queries. So if we take a look at this view, we are just displaying a table which took 24 query to load, which is a little bit strange, right? But we are using Hibernate, then it's not strange. Okay, so we could see uh, the n plus one, the classical n plus one problem here uh, with object relational mapping. So we, we are asking for all the owners. And I, I should make bigger now. It doesn't scale. Okay, so we get all the owners, and then for each owner we make queries into the visits table, and we make queries to the pets table. Right? So very simple. Like if we switch, we get like the, the timeline of all those queries and we can see duration, which tables are being requested, how many rows are returned, and so on. But let's, let's try to uh, fix it a little bit, at least, right? So why, why should we execute 24 queries? We could probably do it with one. And what should we do for that? We should actually check the implementation first, what kind of query it does. So it uses JPA or, or HQL for um, querying from the database and uh, it doesn't actually prefetch uh, the objects with this query, with the original query, so we could change it so that it could prefetch and make a join, like inner join, fetch, and fetch for the pets. And let's see what will happen. So we had 24 queries, switch back, let's try it again, 20. That's a little bit better, but still we haven't, we haven't really solved our problem, right? We still are doing n plus one selects and depending on the first result, we are still you know, not, not scaling very well. Let's change some more stuff. Like uh, if, if we start from owners, uh, then obviously inside owners, there is a collection. Owner. And uh, there is pets collection, right? So, and it tells me that, hey, I'm, I'm fetching this stuff eagerly. Maybe I can change it to do lazily. And inside pets, we have pet type, first of all. Let's try it to lazy. And we don't really dis uh, display any visits in that table, so we don't need those. I just compile the classes again and let me refresh. Yay, I made it in one, with one query. So what I actually demonstrated is that the idea of those two tools working together is that you can interactively observe the results of the backend, what, what is working inside your server. Um, does it seem useful? No? It works now. No. Now, in 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 in, so that's solved problem anyway. Um, not released. Right, but w whatever we did now, we actually broke some stuff here, right? Because whenever I was selecting, I was actually closing the connection, and then I have all those uninitialized uh, uh, leaves in my object tree. So I, I will not be fixing it here because it's, it, it will take a while. Uh, but the idea is like the general idea is that you could have interactive you know, feedback all the time uh, inside your application. That's, that's the goal. And of course, 
There are some other features, but you know, I will not be explaining those. That's not a, demo, a product demo, but just demonstration of the idea. So you may have like different kind of uh, I/O sources, like databases, NoSQL databases, web services. Uh, you may monitor your session state. You may monitor the exceptions, and you know, at the end, it's a so-called a profiler, so uh, it will in, eventually will have profiling capabilities as well. Uh, external services is a new feature. Uh, external web services, you mean? Uh, web services is a new feature that is upcoming, not in the current version. How do we get this pop-up? I mean, this external one. How how did we get it? Or Uh, again, uh, the Java Assist with bipod patching. We patch the server, a server that is um, serving the HTML. So we intercept that, uh, and for every server, it's actually different. So we had to integrate with different containers and uh, different implementations of you know endpoints of the of the server. And currently, the logic is very simple: is that it works. So you open the source. At the very end, right before the body tag, we add our own div, which you know has its own uh, JavaScript, and then this JavaScript does all the magic there. If if you if you have seen New Relic doing uh, like how it works, it doesn't display you the widget, but it actually does exactly the same. It it adds some. Um, some code to profile your JavaScript. Right? So how does it feel? It feels magic, right? <laughs> <laughs> so actually, uh, with Java Assist, sometimes, you know, like using not really a conventional tool to do uh, unusual things, and it feels like, you know, doing this. You, you see something, then that something is not doable, and then you take Java system, you know, put it there. It has to work. Uh, I will skip the fun part, but the, well, the fun part was there. But uh, I can I can give you an, an example of uh, what we had to do for NetBeans, for instance. So our uh, gerable plugin. We have a uh, plugin for NetBeans, IntelliJ, uh, Eclipse, JDeveloper. And for NetBeans, well, obviously, when you build a plugin for this kind of tool, um, it has an API. It has a plugin uh, architecture and so on. But the, the vendors of this application, they might not be thinking of the use cases that you actually need. So for instance, in our case, since we integrate with Hotswap, uh, we needed that uh, Hotswap would be enabled inside NetBeans. And by default, it's disabled, actually. Uh, if you go to Java, debugger, there is a checkbox. I pl apply code changes after save. Compile on save mode only. Uh, and this checkbox is actually disabled by default. And we expect it to be enabled. And there is no API to enable it automatically. So what we actually did, we patched the platform itself to reach to that checkbox and enable it automatically whenever you run the shareable. So, and, and for that, we actually had to, since you, you cannot expect the user that he will configure uh, the platform somehow, you know, internally to uh, configure the patching agent. So we actually have to patch from our plugin, from our own plugin. So uh, NetBeans is already starting, then it's, it's started, and then it only loads the plugin, and plugin decides, okay, where should I put my code? And then add it, adds it, and uh, then we have all these checks over the place. It's not the only place where we have to, we have to add this kind of stuff. But then it works, you know, then the user doesn't have to read all kind of documentation. And okay, I have to set this checkbox and then I have to do like enable something there. Then he just ins installs, 
enables this button, and that's it. Yes, I can I can show you. So if I remove it, it will tell me, hey, you have it disabled. And if I click OK, then it's it's there, right? And it's just because like we need we need to do some stuff that the platform developers didn't really think about. It. Uh, before that, we actually had to do a lot more of patching, especially when starting the Java process from, from the ID we wanted to add our Java agent automatically. And then the platform just wasn't uh, capable of doing that. They didn't have the API. And the good part is that they actually respond to requests like that. So we actually filed uh, a feature request and then they provided the API. So we we could remove our own hacks. So you attach an agent to the running process? No. No, it just starts up with the agent, or with the plugin. The plugin is right here. You see this button, right? So. How does the Jrable work if there is no agent running? Jrable plugin the ID plugin itself and shareable agent are two separate thing, things. They are disconnected. But do not start the ID with the yes, yes, we don't start. That's the and trick. The no, no. That's that's the trick. That's the trick. I actually will show you. So this is the source code of the of the very same plugin that is there. And there is a, like. Um, Patcher class, which which uses Java Assist, which is re, re, repackaged, not to conflict with the internal Java Assist, which might be installed inside NetBeans. So we may use this Java Assist to actually run try patch to patch like we we find the class loader, from the class loader we find the classes, from the set of classes we find the class that we are interested in, and then we patch it. So you don't need to be running inside an agent to use JavaScript? No, no, of course not. Just, just you, can, you can only rewrite the code which is inside the method. You cannot change the schema, so you cannot add new, new methods because this class is already defined. But that's enough in this case. And then, like, you may use reflection to actually reach out to that uh, method or whatever you add it. All right. I think that's it. If you have any questions? Why did you choose JavaScript? Well. ASM is very low level, so you actually have to write bytecode, like those mnemonics, like uh, push, pop, at, whatever, and uh, it's just too much code. It's very performant, so we use it in the core, uh, but for this kind of you know integration, that's like that's an overkill for using uh, ASM. The alternative would be using CGLib, which is based on ASM, but then you are working with a kind of a model, right? The CGLib it creates you uh, a model for you, and uh, whatever uh, the source code you want to add, it will be kind of in in classes. Like you have to model like a graph model of the class which you want to add, uh, and in Java Assist you may see the source code, right? So it's it's actually much easier. No, it uses its own generator. And uh, yeah, f just for integration code, it's much better. It has its own problems, but then when, when you used it enough, then you have workarounds. How do you know what to change if you don't have the source code? You decompile. You decompile. You do what? You decompile the, the binaries. 
And if the binaries are, are obfuscated, you still can patch the obfuscated binaries. Simple. If you, if you cannot patch obfuscated code with Java Assist, if it's just too hard, then there is like a one way again. You go to the bytecode level and patch it with ASM because you don't obfuscate bytecode instructions. In a way. Right? Does it sound fun? No? <laughs>